Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Gray, the creative director of the New York Times live conversation, performance, and screening series, Times Talks. For 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, fashion, music, art, literature, design, and politics. Today, we are pleased to present our first ever art and design festival, three provocative conversations exploring the intersection of art, design, architecture, and fashion, produced in collaboration with New York City by Design. I would like to give a very special thanks to our sponsor, Growy, and to share the following brief video message. Okay, well now down to business. I'm, deli <laughs> I'm delighted to welcome you to our first event, featuring one of the world's leading architects of his generation and one of the world's most influential curators and authorities on contemporary art. Together, they are collaborating on a brand new home for the Studio Museum in Harlem, which celebrates its 50th anniversary this year as the city's premier showcase for African-American art. Moderating today's conversation is a cultural reporter for the New York Times who covers art, architecture, and auctions and has reported extensively on this eagerly awaited project. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our moderator, Robin Pogerman, and our special guests, Sir David R.J. and the director and curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem, Thelma Golden. Thank you for that introduction and welcome to everyone. It's great to be here with these two. Um, I'm a real fan and I have followed their work for some time. Um, and clearly their reputations precede them there, but if you wanna read more, they're in your programs. Um, and that's what brings us here is this project that they are collaborating on. So I wanna start with that. Um, Thelma, there, there was a time when cultural institutions were expanding or renovating, it seemed. Um, all the time, and then some of them started to come up against the challenges of sustaining these projects after they're built. The larger operating costs, not to mention raising large sums of money to get them finished in the first place. Why take this on at a cost of $175 million, and, and why now? Can you talk about sort of the raison d'etre behind this project? Yes, well first, thank you. Great to be here and see all of you. You know, this project um, really became necessary when we really considered at the Studio Museum what our legacy was and could be. You know, the museum is 50 years old this year. We have been working, presenting, and preserving the work of artists of African descent in Harlem since 1968. We've been in our current building over 30 years. It was built in 1914 as a bank, kind of lived on 125th Street in this sort of civic business sense. And while living and working in that building, we clearly, for many years, had presented artists, made exhibitions, engaged audiences. But our program, and the ambition of our program, and the scope of our program, and our needs grew out of the space. And it had lived through its useful life. And we felt that at this moment, to really conceive of a building for the institution that could live for another 50 years and beyond in Harlem could be a very important step for the institution to take. I remember when I was first writing about it, you, some of the details about the constraints of the building itself really struck me, namely that you would have to close to switch shows. Yes. There was no way to, I mean, to talk about what were some of the other ways in which you, you know the building just has sort of outlived its purpose. Well, you know, it's a fantastic building. You know, it was built as a bank, as I said, in 1914, and the pioneering architect, Max Bond, renovated it for the Studio Museum. And it's a really great example of adaptive reuse. 
but it was a building that was not meant to be a museum. So we had to close down in between exhibitions so that we could change exhibitions. Um, our ceiling heights were really limited, you know, even though quite often people imagine that they saw work that was much bigger in the space. I always credit that to the work's power and majesty, not our ceiling heights, which were inc are incredibly limited. The space itself um, didn't allow us to create rooms right, mm. in any real way. We also, for many years, education is a cornerstone of what we do, but we've been doing it in the gallery and some of our lower level spaces. We've never been able to really fully actualize our mission as it relates to serving our audiences in that way. And we suffered from just what came from having an old building, right? Which I is like the having air conditioner was loud. I know, I was I hoping you didn't notice that. You know, Robin came for a tour, and you know when you have a house that does things but you don't want people to notice it, you know, Robin kept saying, isn't that loud? And I just kept talking, right? I was like, no, oh, I don't hear that. For sure. What, what sound? She's like, what's that sound? And, right? and it was our air conditioning. And so, yes. yes, but you know, it's like an old house. Yeah. It required a lot. And you know, the institution, you know, the directors that preceded me had done amazing work to take care of this building and continue to expand it, but really the opportunity and the opportunity presented in, you know, working with David to create our first purpose-built state-of-the-art museum yeah. for the Studio Museum in Harlem seemed like this was the moment, if not now, when? David, tell us a little bit about kind of your process going into this project. What was your mandate from Thelma and the rest of the museum and sort of what, what, what sort of the operating ideas that you took with you as you began the design process? Thank you. No, um, well, Thelma uh, is one of those unique clients, um, and it's not because I've known her for nearly 20 years, which is incredible um, in the art world and seeing how she's operated. But um, uh, what she did, which was quite magical, was to not sort of hand a telephone book of sort of, you know, here are the 20 rooms we need and all that sort of stuff, which you know is very useful and important. But her primary brief to us was to state that she wanted something to encapsulate um, the, her analysis of Harlem. Um, and that was really powerful. She talked about trying to see if we could make a building that captured the spirituality, the spiritual spaces of Harlem, trying to capture the theatricality of Harlem with its incredible institutions like the Apollo and all the other theaters. Um, and also trying to capture the sense of the street, you know, the sort of incredible residential streets with their incredible stoops. And I was really struck. I remember when she told me that, I was like, uh, and, you know, the museum? And she sort of, you know, yes, the museum, but really that was the kind of moment. And it just, I kind of, it sunk in and it was very powerful. And I think it almost produced, you know, within 24 hours, a, a sketch. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, in my work, I'm very interested in trying to always stop what I call my automatic tendency to design things that I know and to kind of design the familiar. So I'm always trying to find in each project a way of really placing myself in that context and what, and trying to kind of manifest what I think the work is about. So that, that brief really for me was kind of propulsion fuel. It really allowed me to not be subversive in any way or you know have my own clandestine operations to go look at things and let them influence the way I was going to work but um but it just allowed me to just allow the you know the team to go straight into that content that she sort of provided and um it then sort of created a series of surprising opportunities for a museum um you know how do you make for a community which really has its most of its public life on the street or in th or in churches or theaters this new public cultural space um, and, and, and what was going to be the welcome, what was going to be the signifier on the street, how, how are we going to kind of take this incredible legacy that Max Bond had created, um, uh, you know, by, you know, Max did something incredible with no money in, the, in this bank building, which was to create uh, a single volume, a single space, which was to try and get as much height as possible, but with three different qualities. So um, they, they are, you know, now very modest and people don't even notice them, but I was also incredibly moved by that. He created in a volume, a bank space, sort of a, a mezzanine and a gallery and a double height space. And in a way, he sort of codified the sort of gallery operating um, sort of uh, status of the museum. Mm -hmm. And all the artists I know had kind of different experiences about that. And that was also profound. So mm -hmm. this idea of sort of um, what the residue of a place does to 
the display of art and the history of looking at art is also with something that's also then sort of a, sort of um, laminated into the project. So the project is all those things um, put together. I remember Thelma describing these three elements: um, the spirituality, um, the idea of a sta the stage, and mm. the idea of the stoop, yeah. which I love. Yeah. I want to go to some images so that we can see what we're talking about, um, and you guys can see it there. That is the exterior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess you know one of the things I would love for you to talk about is that sense of wanting to invite people in and how you decided to do that because to some extent that, that is a limitation of the current building mm. and so much um, of the importance that you want this to be a place, a, a gathering place as well as a place to see art. So why don't you, David, start with um, yeah, you know, no, how you I'm, did that. Absolutely, the building sort of is organized as a series of frames and in a way, they're sort of referencing the sort of incredible masonry architecture that, that's the sort of residential architecture. We have these long walls and what we call in architecture edicular frames, these sort of ornate sort of framing around windows, um, which sort of punctuate and sort of articulate the sort of building street. So it's a series of frames that really um, frame the different programs in the museum. So central is the studio, which is the kind of main horizontal band, and an education space underneath it, which is a kind of lower band complementing it, because central to the mission is the next generation coming up, artists then producing and then creating uh, work. And then the galleries are quite opaque, so they're sort of quite mute. But then I wanted to see if we could completely, as it were, dissolve the building as it came to the ground. So as it almost hits the ground, you know, the ultimate sense is that it practically disappears and it's just a, a sort of yard that you're going into. Mm -hmm. In a way, what some of the kind, another thing was that, that incredible yard that has the best parties yeah. <laughs> in the and summer. That's the best parties. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> is, is, and that's another, that's a view in, in section we said. Exactly. Um, but this one, I, uh, actually this I wanted to talk about because yeah. this is sort of the stoop. And yeah. as I recall you talking about it, Thelma, it's a free space mm -hmm. where people can just come um, talk a little bit about how you envision this and why it's important in, to this project. Well, you know, when thinking about how to even conceive of what this institution should be in thinking in architectural terms, it was very clear to me, you know, I mean, David said, you know, we, I didn't give him a telephone book that was a brief because the brief was clear, right? Anyone who'd been in the building understood what we needed. So it seemed to me that it needed, we needed to populate this idea with some sense of form, right? And be able to create some sense of context. And so for me, in offering the brief, the street, the stage, and the sanctuary, I was thinking of the street as the space of engagement. You know, the artist Chris Ophelia, who is a dear friend of both of us, once said to me when he walked in the museum, what's out there, meaning the street, is not in here. Mm. And that- That was a critique. Mm. Yeah. No, it was an observation. Okay. I mean, really, it was an observation. <laughs> And the observation is what then for me began to sort of think about how to begin to enact the dissolve, right? And the stage was about, as David said, this idea of these incredible performing art spaces. You know, when people think of Harlem, wherever I go in the world, you know, when people think of Harlem, that's where from the Harlem Renaissance forward, they think of that. And for me, that was about how to create a space that entertains, right, in the broadest way. And the sanctuary is because Harlem is a community of sanctuaries, and those spaces from the most modest to our grandest all share, for me, a sense of reverence. And so for me, the sanctuary was about how to create a space that inspires. And what was beautiful about that is, as David said, 24 hours later, there was a sketch from him, but he added the stoop, right? Mm -hmm. So I had street, stage, sanctuary, and he came back with number four, which was the stoop. And that's then how David envisioned that in the design, which really created this way where from the street, you are able to see what's going on in the museum space, but also that the space could live informally during the day as a gathering space. How to create what would be an extension of a kind of communal public space mm -hmm. in the way. I mean, that's why I love Harlem, right? Life happens on the street in Harlem. Yep. You know, I go to other neighborhoods, people are discreet, right? You walk down the street, <laughs> you know, lots of, you know, sort of sense of discretion. In Harlem, the street lives, right, as a public space of engagement. So how could we create that in this space, but also make this space multidimensional in its use? So the idea will be that the lobby coming in at street level and this space, which also to the side includes a cafe, um, as well as the coat check and the restrooms would allow the public to engage in those spaces um, before entering the galleries. 
It was fascinating to me that there was a point at which you as a board and as an institution even considered moving out of Harlem, which is kind of a radical thought. And you really came around to realizing that core to the museum's identity was also this sense of place and where it is rooted. You have a long history in Harlem. You both ha have homes there now. Mm -hmm. You know, Talk about the importance of staying there and, and being in this neighborhood um, and, and why it's integral to this institution's identity. Well, we are the Studio Museum in Harlem. And you've thought of changing that name, too, <laughs> and you didn't. Our founders very distinctly understood the power then and in the future of what it would mean to root uh, within Harlem. Harlem as its physical space, right? Harlem geographically. But also, they were thinking about Harlem as it represents the sort of idea of a 21st century black metropolis. And so, yes, I will say um, that among um, our board, the board generally, our building committee, we explored everything because there was a commitment to think about how to continue to serve, to right. serve artists and audiences. I will say the idea to move out of Harlem, and you know, for Harlemites to understand, it wasn't even so much out of Harlem. It, we were thinking of moving maybe 20 blocks north, but that felt very far away, it became very clear after looking and analyzing it that also where we are physically on 125th Street sits almost at, at dead center, right? And to me, that has always been very important too, the centrality of our location. And so it became very clear that the opportunity to stay where we had always been, at least for in this building, you know, when we were founded, we were on Fifth Avenue between 125th and 126th Street um, until 1979, until we moved here. But it felt like we are the Studio Museum in Harlem. And while we certainly can imagine there in a future, there could be other studio museums in so many other places, being the Studio Museum in Harlem, staying in Harlem, continuing to be inspired by Harlem was very important to our future, as important as it was to our past. Talk about, um, David, how did that the neighborhood sort of inform your design? I mean, to mm -hmm. what extent are you drawing on the aesthetics of the place yeah, um, for the spirit? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm also, what was, what's been amazing, because I live in Harlem as well, um, is that um, I, wanted to also see, I knew that the city had rezoned 125th Street. So also Harlem is changing. Anybody who's gone, who you know, goes to Harlem regularly can see all the kind of changes that are happening. It's a commercial street that's gonna get much bigger, become a kind of much bigger commercial avenue. Um, and in a way, what I was also interested in is seeing if we could create not a kind of mimicry, but a kind of resistance to that that's happening. And so imagine a new future that wasn't necessarily about just the commercial field, but a resistance in that. Because in a way, I think that what artists do well is to allow us th to kind of imagine possible mm -hmm. futures and possible resistances. So in a way, the building for me was to see if it could kind of work to kind of anchor something that maybe spoke to a, a, a time that might be going. So that was really very, very much on my mind. And in a way, um, you know, my walks in the, in, the, in, the, in the community and in the city was just always about trying to kind of have a feeling about that kind of um, the opacity, the transparency, the kind of porosity of, of the kind of way in which people interact and the way in which the buildings become the backdrop, the theatrical backdrop for that incredible life. Mm -hmm. So could the museum become the backdrop that sort of signifies this specific place and then be this opportunity to still, you know, because what you want is that you don't want the museum to become a place where people feel like they don't want, it's not part of them, but you want it to feel like it continually becomes sort of welded into their psyche and then becomes a place that they covet and see as their place and then a stranger's come, they want to be taken there because they've heard about this place which is coveted by the neighborhood and then, you know, you get magic. Mm -hmm. I think that's how a, yeah. a place for me gets magic. So how to kind of create those layers without mimicry was really very strong. And, you know, it's always, you know, in my work, it's always, you know, the, the tension between being referential but not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it part of the gentrification or is it sort of... Well, this is the dilemma. In, so in I'm skirting around it. it. Right. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, there is a kind of... The, the, the rezoning means that there is a, an influx of money. Right. But, but that's not, you know, and that's not, the, that's not a negative or positive. I'm not judging that. But in a way... The question is, how do you imagine the future without it necessarily, you know, with it having some kind of relationship to a past and a potentially mm -hmm. am amazing uh, projection into this? Right. 
The, um, you mentioned artists, and that is so mm -hmm. clearly fundamental to this place. Mm -hmm. um, can you both sort of address um, how this is a new building for artists and, to, and, and, and give a sense of the history of your residency program and why it, it, is, it remains something that's such a priority for you, yeah. um, and how this project you know, will address the, that importance? Well, the studio in our name comes from the fact that from the time we were founded, the museum's always had a residency program, which um, shortly after began, began hosting three artists a year, um, for a year, in studio spaces in the building. And that's unique in a museum context, right? The idea that artists creating their work and the presentation of work are happening in the same space. In our current building, the artists are on the third floor of the building, facing 125th Street. And to an artist, when I talk to them about their residency year, while they all have different experiences of their art during that year, they all talk about what it was to have that proximity to the street, but also to be in the building. Mm -hmm. So that it was very clear in thinking about a new building that of course the residency program would remain. Um, the gift that David gave us in the design was that he placed it almost exactly the studios where they had been. And for me, that is incredibly special, the idea that they will stay physically in the same space. But in terms of our future, the residency program is just one part of the museum's long commitment to artists, right? You know, the museum was founded to present and preserve the work of artists of African descent at a time when that was not happening in many museums. The museum sought to rewrite the canon and include black artists and understand their contributions. And early in the museum's life, it saw itself as part of a global black conversation mm -hmm. in thinking about Africa and you know, artists of African descent everywhere. And so the galleries, as well as the spaces to engage um, with art, give us opportunity now um, to show all kinds of work and really continue to provide the kinds of incredible exhibition and presentation opportunities that we have through our 50 years and to continue to do that for generations of artists to come. And you, David, have some very close relationships with artists. You've designed spaces for them. But I mean, as far as I can tell, this is a, your first sort of fine arts institution. Am I right? Um, for Designed for like paintings on the walls. No. No, what else? <laughs> yeah. I can read off the list. I I, I, I'll take that. I wish yeah. we could say that, but not. But, no, so um, then talk about what is involved when, you know, there's often, I often hear in architecture, you don't want the space to upstage the work. Yeah. So how do you balance that? Well, I mean, I think that it's, you know, what's been, my, I think my whole sensibility has also really been very informed from my ver very early days as a student by artists. I went to the Royal College of Art, which is an art school, and I, you know, I, I was more in the sort of um, the theory classes with the artists than I was in the architecture sort of classes. And um, my, my, you know, my best, my best friends to this day are from that time. So in a way, I've had this sensibility, which has been about understanding how artists make work in spaces in their own spaces or find spaces that they work in and then how those, space, those works move to institutions. And, and you know, this has been a fascinating dialogue with people like, some, like Chris Ophelia. I worked with him um, on a studio which then in the end became the subject of a kind of major exhibition at the Victoria Muriel Gallery which was about somehow moving the scale of the studio into um, a commercial space. Mm -hmm. And then from there it was bought by the Tate and then moving it into an institutional sort of framework. So this idea of trying to understand the scales of spaces and the history of spaces. There's a kind of typology of spaces from you know, homes, et cetera, to the factories or to sheds that were kind of very much favored by artists, sort of neutral sort of volumes that have a certain kind of relationship to the production that they're making. I always found the artists were always gravitating to certain productions that were spaces that were analogous to their productions mm -hmm. and, and gave sympathy. Either they were trying to um, find ways to kind of um, imagine what it might be in the world. Like for instance, when I did a house in London called The Dirty House, which was, uh, you know, 2004, um, I did it as a house and studio. And basically, you know, the brief with my clients, it was a two young artist, Tim Noble, Sue Webster, was to see if we could make the studio like as close to a commercial or institutional space as possible so that they could see mm -hmm. how um, the, the work would resonate in the public realm at, in the intimacy of those spaces, because most artists don't have that sort of thing. So this idea of kind of oscillating between what is that intimate space of production and what is the space of, of making, uh, presenting art is something that I've been very kind of uh, engrossed in. And so just talking with uh, Thelma, 
um, you know, and the team, uh, it's, it was very easy to start to understand a series of scales that I ma might imagine those possibilities that are in the sort of art world right now, and also can possibly change in their nature to deal with the future, the, the future of art that we know is kind of a, we're on the sort of threshold of with digital and, and sort of um, internet art. So, you know, the, the thinking is that we've made a series of flexible spaces that can be at once intimate, can be rooms, can be almost like factory spaces, can be soaring, uh, sort of airy spaces um, that can allow these productions to happen. So we're, we're trying to mm -hmm. put into the project as much flexibility as we kind of physically can without literally saying it's about moving walls that are moving right. mechanically. It's really looking at the topology of mm -hmm. spaces that in themselves have a weight and can support and give dignity to the art. Yeah, I mean, and I've been reporting on, like, for example, the shed, which is going up mm -hmm. on the far west side, and mm. there is this conundrum of by the time the building's done, you know, the art making of our culture might have changed in terms of what the needs and demands are. Mm. So you're building a permanent space that does need to be able to kind of roll with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that seems challenging. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. um, in terms of just to kind of segue a little bit into your um, Smithsonian project, mm -hmm. Um, the African American Museum, which has just been considered such a, a wide success, but it, it very much involves a different kind of display. Totally. Um, so can you talk a little bit, I want to actually show an image of that, um, mm -hmm. just what, well, the, how the considerations are different in a project yeah. like this. Yeah. I mean, I gather this, you know, the scale is considerably larger, but also you are dealing with installations of a very different kind. Yes, and it's, it's not, it's, I mean, it has a visual arts component at the end, but it is an, what we're calling a narrative museum. Um, it's a, analogous to a kind of archival museum in the sense that it has, it, it has a range of works from you know, fabric, photography, sort of you know, organic matter, you know, wooden things, metal things, et cetera, right through to the visual arts. So it's really a kind of, it's more a traditional museum with a narrative put on it. Mm -hmm. um, and the narrative is what drives the kind of exhibition content, mm -hmm. which kind of allows you to, follow the story because it has a storyline it's not just about pieces in a traditional archival museum like the met or something like that um there's an order through which you, uh, you it, go it, through it there's right? a, a preferred order preferred you're not order. you're not you're not what one of the things that i actually was very strongly against was not to force but you know, what we don't want is also to feel like um, a disney ride or something it's not about you go in this way and you can't turn back that, that you can somehow be able to sort of you know, you can look at history, you know, you can look at history, you can look back, you can go into certain sections and come back. Mm -hmm. But also the, the radical thing was to see, say that we would make the museum analogous to the experience, that we would go instead of horizontal, like a palace, which is what most museums are, they're very palace-like and it's a series of suites of rooms, that I wanted you to go down into history, to go 80 feet into the ground, 75 feet into the ground, and then to rise up. And just to use that simple emotional experience of being completely immersed without light to being flooded with light as a way to choreograph the narrative. And that's really the, the big party of the project was to, to, to turn a building sideways and to then have you, have the, cur the curators follow the building's kind of agenda. And then so at the end, you know, it's, it's, it's designed, it has three parts, history, and then it has the, then the second part, which is the migration from the south to the cities, the, the, the sort of the, the community entering the professional lives, becoming employed away from um, um, the sort of land, as it were. And then the last part is the contribution in, in 20th century culture to world culture, to American culture, to world culture, the way in which it explodes. You know, some people refer to it, the sort of Afro-modern moment, the sort of moment where it's sort of, you know, music, theater, arts, mm -hmm. you know, visual arts, all sort of somehow start to kind of permeate throughout the world. So it has these three areas. And the third part is the most luminous light part, because it's really also trying to say that it's also the part that's connecting with what we are now. There are then vistas across the mall. The, the building tries not to be hermetic. It's, it has these special windows that frame views that always are continually taking you back to the narrative, but then sort of deposit you at a sort of very privileged point to look at um, the Mall of America, which is one of those, it has a space which I think I think the museum can de definitely say it has the, the best panoptic view of them all if you want to just go and see that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thelma, you mentioned this idea of the canon, and to some extent, mm -hmm. the Studio Museum led the way in mm -hmm. challenging our notions of it. Mm -hmm. And now we are in a cultural moment where mm -hmm. this is just a regular part of the conversation increasingly. Mm -hmm institutions around the country are revisiting um, their collections, mm -hmm. they are acquiring new things, mm -hmm. deaccessioning others. 
they're also thinking about it in terms of their hiring mm -hmm. um, and in terms of their exhibitions. Mm -hmm. So if that succeeds ultimately and we play it out mm -hmm. and this becomes a more integrated part of our museums everywhere, then what's the case for the, museum, the studio museum? Why do we still need it? Because I think that we need institutions that both operate around an idea of breadth and also operate within a sense of depth. I think that you know, no one is more thrilled than I am that we are able to have a conversation about seeing the work of artists of African descent in museums all over the country and all over the world, right? And see artists of the past finally getting credit. I mean, just this week, Kerry James Marshall set you know, a re an auction record. Yeah. So we, we, I am, no one is more proud of those achievements, but I still know that the sense of purpose and intention and authority around this sort of commitment to the depth of engagement around African American art and artists of African descent will be the Studio Museum's mission now and forever. And I think that has an incredible amount of purpose. And I think we bring to that purpose a sort of passion for the idea that being stewards of the culture and being stewards of these artists, their legacy and their history is a role that the museum can and should have no matter how much change there might be in other institutions who are just coming to this conversation now. And in terms of you know, seeing so many of these curators you've launched and artists, frankly, that got their start with you, I mean, do you have a sense of constantly being raided and people are always taking your people? And um, okay. I don't like the way that sounds. It's like playing it's close subjects. to, yeah, exactly. No, 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 it's quite the opposite. It is quite the opposite. It gives me an incredible sense of pride and really is at core. You know, I mean, I'm a curator, right? So that, you know, my life in this field um, for many years before becoming director of this institution has been about the presentation of art. And as a curator, I had an incredible career making exhibitions, both at the Whitney Museum and at the Studio Museum. And through that, that experience of mine, it feels to me that the one thing that I can do in this field is to make that possible for others. So I am thrilled at the number of curators who have had the opportunity to work with us at the Studio Museum and who now live and work in other institutions around the country. I sit with an incredible amount of real deep passion for the idea of creating more voices in this field is what makes the field richer. And that's what I think we all should be doing. And they come back. They come back and, but you know, but Even really cut. more importantly, they go on and do work that is incredible, work that I couldn't have imagined um, that would happen. And that's what I think is really when we sort of talk about the contribution of an institution like the Studio Museum, it is wider than just what happens on the walls, right? right? It really is about this sort of idea, what I say, cultural capital, right? Yeah. That's what we have created. And that's what, in so many ways, I mean, David and I often speak about it. I mean, we're the, building a building, but the building is really just the container for the soul of this institution that has such an important role and will continue to. David, you know, clearly you had already been on a fast um, sort of trajectory to fame, oh. um, but <laughs> okay. we'll often talk about how quickly that happened. I'm so happy it looks so seamless. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> right. Um, I'm gonna show a couple more images of this museum, mm -hmm. but this one seems to, in particular, have taken you to another level in yeah. terms of yeah. just mm -hmm. international prominence. Yeah. Talk a little bit about how that's affected you personally and professionally. And I mean, does it mean you're not going to have time for you know private residences anymore, which you used to do part of? And have you be, do have to be more selective? And do you have to hire more people? And <laughs> all the above. <laughs> but, not, but some of the, but 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 the critical you know what's interesting is we we have grown, but we have not. I've made a very conscious decision to not, you know, there's one fundamental thing about the subject is that the, the pleasure of being given the privilege to make architecture is, is such an incredible privilege for me that what I did not want to do with this fame is to turn that act into a commercial business. Um, I've sort of seen many peers kind of, you know, get that moment and then just become these huge businesses. And you sort of become a manager and you sort of become a kind of presentation token head. I'm still involved in every single project in my office, um, from the tiniest thing right to the largest thing. And we continually choose to do a diversity of projects, even though sometimes economically, you know, my, 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 I have an economic 
sort of set of people who are constantly saying, well, that's not very profitable. But, <laughs> you know, but, 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 but actually, you know, my question, which I always remember, you know, I, Eduardo Sutomura, a great architect that I work for, is a young architect. You know, it's, you know, what, what fuels you and what gives you pleasure? And I, you know, that for me is the bottom line of the expansion and the size of the practice. So it grows to allow us to get the kinds of projects that allow me to kind of love what I'm doing. And I think the minute that goes, I'm, I'm, you know, I think if it becomes a business, then there are much easier ways to make money than architecture. I would not recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very tough mm -hmm. thing to try and make money. Well, I mean, people make money out of it, but mm -hmm. I think there's something about the act of making that's quite sacred and is about a kind of a sort of a pact between the society and, and the maker that's entrusted that I really feel committed to. And so um, I really want our studio, even though we are doing bigger things and we are working around the world and doing bigger things, we're also doing very small things. And this idea of the craft of architecture is central to every single project. Okay, we are gonna go to questions soon, so get them ready. Mm. Um, please make them questions, not statements, and concise so that we can get to <laughs> as many of you as possible. Um, but before we do that, I wanted you guys to just address you know, clearly um, there aren't, there is not an abundance of prominent black architects in the world, nor um, museum directors. And that is just still a reality. You know, to what extent is that a burden you carry in terms of either bringing others along, representing, um, you know, feeling like you have to sort of lead the way in a way that is to some extent onerous or one you accept or it's no longer an issue? Um, God, that's... Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that it's almost, uh, how do I say it? It's, I think that there's not even, I don't know any other condition apart from this condition right. <laughs> from the day I was born. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if that maybe helps you. Mm -hmm. In the sense that the idea of kind of operating in worlds where one was always a little bit sort of different has been, you know, and having to kind of represent has always been the kind of agency that's always been in the sort of room. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I mean, what is very important to me is, is that actually getting to this level that actually I'm able to give what I know to a generation that's coming up or, or to my peers. And I'm very, you know, I'm very generous with that and that, that's something that I'm very committed to. I've tried to teach and, and I did teach, but it's, it, teaching was very, very exhausting. But actually I'm very interested in mentorship. So, um, you know, there's certain studios that I reach out to and, you know, help them to not make the kind of mistakes that I made. And you know, to mentor younger generations, I'm very open to, especially young studios, uh, especially um, architects of color who are opening new studios. Mm -hmm. Really, you know, the biggest thing is surviving those first six years. It's, yeah. If you can manage to survive those first six years, you have a chance. And it's so tough because you need patrons and you need to find those patrons. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a thing that is really present. Yeah. How about you? And I think that you know, I, I don't think of it so much as a burden, but a responsibility, right? It is very clear that, you know, for both of us, that, you know, there are many people who have tried to do what we do now, um, and the circumstance didn't allow it. Yeah. So the opportunity we have, the privilege that we have in being in these positions means that we both have to talk about what it means to be us, but also to sort of model the possibilities right. of different forms of leadership and their effectiveness in widening Right, the sense of possibility. You know, I think I feel, you know, incredibly committed to the idea that, you know, I grew up in this city. I have spent, you know, my entire life in museums. I was a high school intern at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I wrote in my college essay to Smith College that I wanted to be a curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. You know, so this is the life I imagined for myself. And even though there were not many examples, there were a few. Um, and you know, three that I'll name, Lowry Stokes Sims, whose you know, image I saw in newspapers in the New York Times, which is what then allowed me to understand that it was possible. Right. Kinnister McShine, mm. the late Kinnister McShine, right. who you know, really created, again, this sense of possibility for me of what this could be, and the first museum director I worked for when I was an intern at the Studio Museum was Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell. So actually, in a field that perhaps doesn't have so much diversity in a general way, my image of a museum director was an African-American woman. So of course, 
this is what could be possible. And I hope that's what others feel when they see me in the position I am now, when they see David as an architect, you know, mm -hmm. running this firm, that this is possible. But I do think that perhaps this issue of really understanding the need to talk about equity, yeah. right? Lots of people want to talk about diversity. Really talking about equity is the conversation that needs to be had in our, in our cultural fields, in our cultural world, that really will produce change. Mm -hmm. Actually, Michael Govan, the director of LACMA in LA, recently announced that he was teaming up with Arizona State mm -hmm. to have a three-year program to develop art, uh, curators of color mm -hmm. and also museum officials mm -hmm. um, to address this lack. And you know, when we did this New York Times art conference recently, Pamela Joyner, the collector, talked about how people don't really grapple with that. You know, sometimes these early entry level jobs are not paid mm -hmm. and people of color can't afford to take them. I mean, and so what are the hurdles in a way along that keep them from going through the pipeline? Mm -hmm. Why aren't there more of them coming up? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think that's just too big a question or it's the one we need to be wrestling with now? Well, it's the one we need to be wrestling with, but it has many answers. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of both strategies and models. I'm a very proud board member of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And so this program that's been launched with ASU incredibly important. I think it will be a model yeah. and it can be replicated and I know that it will provide opportunity to to make that happen but I think we you know have to talk about the way in which at first we just need to acknowledge this still remains yeah. an issue and that one that if we want our field our cultural field to be rich and broad, to reflect our culture and reflect right our true diversity, right. and more importantly, our complexity, then we have to address these questions. Okay. Questions? There's one here. I think we do that. Yeah. <laughs> I think we do just that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my question is about the still the image of the uh, the fruit for the city of the museum, and it looked like one of the the panels was very familiar to me to the uh, panels in the uh, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and I wondered if that was intentional or not, mm -hmm. or was it something I saw. Oh. One of the panels. It was a picture of, of the, the facade. Image. Yeah, the facade. Thank oh wow. Um, in what sense? Could you just explain a little bit more? Well, it's from the day I saw it. All right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, can we go back? Yeah. That was it. One of those first images of the outside. Yeah. Yes. The facade. Okay. I don't know if we can do that. And we also yes. do have microphones, guys. If if anybody yeah. wants to line up and have and be ready with questions. Um, I don't know if you can address whether there's yeah, similarities. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. Yeah. So. Here. Yeah. 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 It looks like the image. The image looks like the same panels that are on the outside. Or is that just? No, 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 no. This th wow. this building is a um, masonry building, so it's a it's a terrazzo um, material, and the the museum is a cast aluminium with a bronze finish. Yeah. So one's metal, and this one's masonry. Um, yeah, so it, it's maybe you're seeing this, this, what we've done on this building, maybe what you're picking up is that there's some golden elements. And the golden elements are just us suggesting that the building can be curated with art. So we also see the building as a series of frames that you know, public artworks can be staged on, mm -hmm. it, in, on the entire length of, you know, the entire height of the building, not just in specific places. Let me be very clear, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. about the Sotheby's uh, result yes. and what are you going to do with all that money? Well, we're, well, thank you. We had a benefit auction and we're really thrilled by that. But the, the artists who generously donated their work to be sold on behalf of uh, the museum, those funds are going into our capital campaign and are allowing us to build this beautiful 
amazing building. Did you see how much money it was? How much did it make at Sotheby's this week? Did you oh, have a total? Oh, just about $20 million, yeah. $20 million. Yay. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, my question is, um, I'm a huge fan of both of you. Um, we are too, of uh, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. Um, my question is, if within a building, especially a new shiny one, you have to be careful first and foremost of the real estate, mm -hmm. whether you're presenting or making, I've always been uh, uh, inured to the difficulty, especially in dance studios, you have to mm -hmm. take your shoes off, don't eat in there, mm -hmm. there's a piano, there's a mirror. Right. How do you take, because many artists' visions ruin real estate. And, and need to, and how does the real estate stand up to that type of operation before it amends the vision of the artist? Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> um, I think, question. Streb, thank you. Yeah. And thank you, just. Why don't you say who she is? This is Streb, the person who always wants, makes me want to feel uh -huh. that I can be brave and courageous <laughs> because her work <laughs> is so brave and courageous. And um, you know, also we've spoken of you recently because of course I always think of the groundbreaking for the Whitney Museum of American Art, which included you and we will have a groundbreaking at some point. No, Streb, you're right. And you know, what's so amazing, you know, I, I have so much um, real nostalgia and sentiment for our current building because one of the things about this adaptive reuse is that it's not precious at all, right? So the opportunity, and it shows the scars of artist's use. So when an artist would say to us, I need to cut into the floor, it's not precious, we've done it. You know, when we needed to hang from the ceiling, we found a way to do it. The walls have all been sheetrock, and I want us to continue to be able to work that way, and I think the genius of David's design, and because he works with artists, is that the building is beautiful, it has really sensuous textures, but it's not precious. So they're gonna be cutting into your floor, Dave. Oh, for sure. It's not precious. I, I, I know, I know if, if I know my artist friends, the, the yeah. first show will destroy the And Streb, the let me put an invitation <laughs> now. If you wanna come and jump and roll and do things in this space, I'd love to have you do that. God, you heard it here. All right. Um, before we take the next question, I want to mention that David is doing his first skyscraper in New York. Yes. Which is so exciting. I wish we had an image of it. I meant to. 130 William Street. <laughs> um, it's on William Street? It's on yeah. William Street, yeah. And they have, it has these like outdoor loggias or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm terrified of balconies on towers, just putting it up. There. But you're yeah. doing it. <laughs> so we have these loggias in the sky. But, um, so what's the timing and when will we yeah. It's starting it? now. It started um, and the, um, it's going to be two, two and a bit years. Um, but it's, uh, it's right next to Frank Gehry's tower. It's, William Street is one of the first streets in New York, so it's really interesting, and we're creating a kind of park with the building, so I'm very, very excited about it. A it's positive real estate development. Yeah, it's, yeah. Okay, yeah, Thank next. You. And we have another mic over there, guys. So if anyone in that aisle. Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Laurie, and this question is um, for David. I work with um, iGeneration Youth Magazine. Uh, first of all, look out for a media request. Um, but <laughs> I've been asked um, by students, actually, we try to cover stories that, you know, around the world that should be in the media, but often, you know, just are not covered. And we wanted to know, are you working or have you worked on any youth-related projects that are, like, interesting or innovative just anywhere? I mean, obviously, the Smithsonian, but, you know, besides that. <laughs> um, no, that's that's... I haven't, I haven't, um, well, no, I have. I've worked on several, but they're really about really I imagining institutions that kind of understand the full range of uh, the users, so children are part of that. I mean, specifically to do with children, we did the studio museum, um, the children's uh, storytelling museum mm -hmm. in um, the Sugar Hill project that we did on 155th and St. Nicholas Avenue, and that was to create a new institution which is really dedicated to kind of bringing young children into um, the art world and being able to come close to real collections, to have storytelling with artists, and to workshop in a, in a really very beautiful uh, space. But, uh, but my work that I've been doing in libraries, I'm sort of fascinated by libraries and the reinvention of libraries, especially when people thought that the libraries are going to be dead because of the internet, but actually what we realize is that the library has become a kind of social um, typology that actually kind of allows all generations to see each other and the reinvention of them for me as an architect has been very powerful that actually young people can feel that it's not about going to the mall but there is this public space that is about 
knowledge and, and, and exchange of ideas, which we really, really we need to re-edify within our communities and our societies. Mm -hmm. So just simple things like remaking libraries, remaking community centers for me are like profoundly important and shouldn't be dis disregarded yeah. because they're these important things, as yeah. well as new inventions of sure. how to engage. Yeah. Sure. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks thank very you. much. Anyone else? There's somebody in the middle there, yes? Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm working on another range with Noel right now, and I'm, I'm working on several ranges. I mean, design is now very important um, in the studio, and it's, it's usually sometimes piggybacking off uh, big projects that we're working on. So it's become a sort of method that sometimes when we're working on certain cultural projects, we either use collections that we have or we develop new collections. Mm -hmm. So it's now part of the studio. So every, look out for every few years, there'll be something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and is the point of that mostly revenue or is it no, really feel like an extension of? Yeah, you don't make that much money from French. It's a myth. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so properly because supposed I to say like that. I'm going to get killed. <laughs> no. <laughs> no it's but a lot of architects do this kind of thing. Yeah, there's something about the, the enigma of furniture that's very important. Especially in 20th century, I think in 20th century architecture, there was a moment when with the sort of making of modern architecture, there was just the furniture didn't fit the new buildings. Right. Mm -hmm. So there was a whole generation of architects post-war who were like, well, okay, we can't just keep using Victorian furniture in these new slick buildings. So there was an explosion of new modern sort of pieces of furniture. And we've all inherited that idea that when you make a building which pushes something, that you want to make the furniture that might also inhabit that space. And so that's become culture. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where it's coming from, that when you you know, if when you do something that you, you that pushes it, you want to also see if you can push the built environment that's in it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Others. Yes. Karen. Hello. Uh, my question is about the well, the rezoning of 125th Street was not without controversy, and of course, it made a lot of changes to the way the street functions now. In that 125th Street was a regional center focused primarily on commercial and retail. Mm -hmm. The zoning changes had it to go more toward housing, which is the very push. And of course, a lot of that housing is seen or will be uh, more expensive luxury housing. But one important component to that rezoning was that the, uh, any, the height of buildings, of course, and that buildings were to contain cultural components to be able to get bonuses. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy that the Studio Museum becomes one of the first uh, and especially the uh, new uh, cultural icons for 125th Street that signals that that is a place and of course culture is based on the African American culture. What I'd like to, from for Thelma's perspective as well as David in terms of what you'd like to see for the uh, other parts of culture there, how can we use that as a way of being a bridge to having new people come in but be a part of the community because they participate and give and support the cultural institutions that were there before they got there for cheaper real estate, but one that supports institutions like Studio Museum, the Apollo, the work that's going on right now in the Victoria, but that celebrate the African American culture that made Harlem what it is. And what would that look like if we had more new buildings that were at the caliper here that celebrated those cultural, those new, uh, new cultural institutions, supporting the the old and uh, encouraging other cultural um, institutions on 125th Street to be the engine that drives the economy that helps the people who live there to be a part of this in terms of economic as well as social and bring about more uh, interaction between the old. Okay, uh, let's the give them a chance to answer. And the Karen. Okay. No. Karen, I totally, you. You, I mean, you've said it, right? I mean, what is important about 125th Street is right now, you know, we have the Apollo Theater, the Studio Museum in Harlem, National Black Theater, and the Caribbean Cultural Center when you sort of go from Lexington, you know, all the way to um, St. Nicholas Avenue. In addition to that, we have several cultural institutions that have lived in spaces on 125th Street in the past. I think as we all consider the future of Harlem, we see culture, particularly along the 125th Street corridor, as being exactly
exactly what is needed to create for people a sense of the neighborhood's past and the neighborhood's future and to be the spaces that bring people together. But I also will say that those of us who've been in Harlem for a long time welcome the new cultural institutions that are coming to Harlem, right? The new cultural institutions that see Harlem as a vital community where culture can thrive. And so we feel that this project, I mean, certainly part of our desire to stay on 125th Street is that, you know, the Studio Museum, the, you know, the, the amazing board then and now really understand what it means to be a cultural institution in a neighborhood like Harlem and to be part of that legacy. You know, I often say that, you know, people talk about Harlem in terms of what it was and what it will be, right? Like people, it's hard to fix within the present as a community that has a storied past, but always is talking about its future. And I think the cultural institutions are the places that fix us in the present in Harlem. And that's what I hope we continue to be. One thing I actually wonder is you often hear this question of just the future of museums mm -hmm. and given the sort of digital age we're living mm -hmm. in and the competition for so much entertainment. Um, I mean, and when, when you're thinking about this new project and this new building, it is a bricks and mortar space which to some extent works against the way in which our culture is moving. I mean, how do you guys make sure to A, you know, get over the hurdle of being a place that people are intimidated, intimidated by because institutions have that um, hurdle, but also just to make it of our time and not feel like a relic of how we used to um, kind of spend our leisure time? Mm -hmm. um, it's the eternal question. It's, this is a, this is a, 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 it's a discussion that's always going on. I mean, Two things. One, reimagining architecture, remaking architecture, um, like just fashion or like our lives, like generations that come forward, is critical to just, you know, um, reframe the way in which we're looking at things. So every time we remake an institution, even though it's a museum, we say the word museum, it's different. It shifts, it takes on new agendas, it brings an awareness about something that we were not understanding. It makes collective new identities. And the idea that architecture can frame new collective consciousnesses is for me very, very real. And it's something that I think is one of the powers that architecture has, that it can actually shift a certain kind of context and move it to a new position. It can create ideas about our collective identity, about our democracies. I think architecture can guide that frame and be that frame. Um, I think that architecture, when you just start to think of it almost like a product, then you can start to dismiss it. But I think architecture is more profound than that because I think that it's not because I'm sort of in it, but I think that it's more than just, um, architecture at its best is more than just making buildings because making habitation is actually not architecture. Making architecture is, is the will that we have to translate our ideas about where we are in our time into some built form. So, you know, there's no need for a cathedral. It is an aspirational form. There is no need for a museum, but it is a kind of form that will translate beyond the lives of the people, an idea that was kind of birthed now into the future and hopefully will be relevant and will inspire the next iteration. I always think that the city is also like a sort of slow organism. It's continually evolving and growing. Mm -hmm. um, we th we'd like to think that bricks and mortar is part of a static, but actually, if you look at a sort of fast, if you could run a tape of a, f of a city, a film of a tape of a city, it's extraordinary. It looks like an organism. It grows, it mutates, it shapes, but it's always the same things. It's floors, walls, ceilings, right. but shifting and creating new relationships. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of it. How would you address that? Um, you know, I think that while we are in a constant state of understanding what museums are and what they will be, we remain, the Studio Museum remains committed to art. And I think that with that at, a, at our core, it gives us the opportunity to imagine a future where we might define the terms of how a museum presents, how it understands itself, but still being committed to artists and what they do and having the institution commit to that means we imagine a future. I mean, we've spent a lot of time looking at museums. Yeah. A yeah. lot of time. Yeah. 20 years yeah. of looking at art All in spaces, yeah. right? And what works, what doesn't. Yeah. Sometimes simply to imagine all the different ways in which it can exist yeah. and knowing that in this collaboration that we are adding to what's already a vast yeah. vocabulary, but with the uniqueness of this particular moment, this particular situation, and in our case, our very, very, very particular and important mission. 
Okay, thank you both. Thank you all.